Hi, this is Jeff Klein, editor of Radiographics. And today I'm pleased to have with us Drs. Janesh Lekou and Sandeep Aurora from the Department of Radiology at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. And Dr. Gaurav Khatri from UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. These are the authors of one of our featured papers in the current November 2019 issue of Radiographics. Their paper is entitled Magnetic Resonance Imaging of the Male Pelvic Floor. Doctors Lekou, Aurora, and Khatri, welcome to our November 2019 author podcast. Hey, thanks for inviting us. Well, thanks for doing this. So, Sadiq, we'll begin with you. Uh, there has been a considerable amount of literature uh, reviewing the MR anatomy and functional assessment of the female pelvic floor, but limited material on the male pelvic floor. Your article comes from seven different North American institutions. Uh, so I'd ask you, is this a difficult subject to write about and, and why so? Yeah, this was, uh, this just started as uh, I was attending Society of Abdominal Radiology meeting and I've had a couple of cases of male pelvic floor and I met Garo there in the reception. Basically asked him, you know, I, I don't know anything about it. And uh, have you uh, have you had any cases of male pelvic floor? Like how should we approach the male pelvic floor imaging? And uh, that's where this uh, idea started out. You know, we all pulled together our cases. Uh, we invited other people from Society of Abdominal Radiology, uh, Pelvic Floor Dysfunction Disease Focus Panel uh, to have contribute cases. And then I found Janesh as the resident to work with. And uh, that's how we, you know, uh, scoured the lit literature. There are a few papers like, you know, there may be like 10 male pelvic papers as compared to a thousand female pelvic papers out there. So we were able, we wanted to write a good, um, a good article and uh, thankfully it worked. Yeah, we were able to find some good cases. Terrific, well, thank, thanks very much for that. We're obviously glad that you did. So Gaurav, following uh, the introduction and the paper, you review the normal male pelvic floor anatomy, including the superficial perineal pouch, urogenital and uh, pelvic diaphragm, fascia, and ligaments, using illustrations that appear in the paper as figures one uh, through three. You then discuss the MR imaging protocol for the assessment of male pelvic floor dysfunction, which is detailed in table one in the paper. Uh, is there anything in particular you'd like to highlight in the MR protocol for our viewers? And as you speak, we'll show table one. Sure, yes, uh, so, the, the pelvic floor uh, defecography protocol here is, is, is in table one. The, the crux of this protocol really is the dynamic imaging that is performed with the in sagittal plane with the patient performing multiple maneuvers, uh, most importantly, the defecation. So as you can imagine, when these patients come to the radiology department and are asked to defecate on the table, it can be quite sort of... Um, an embarrassing moment for them if they don't know or expect that this is what's going to be asked of them before they come. So the important part of this protocol really is is not in this table, but it's it's patient education prior to actually performing it. And that actually starts with the referring physician. So a lot of times we have a very good relationship with our referring physicians. They are able to explain to the patient the importance of, of this examination uh, and, and sort of um, the patient then expects that they'll come here and they'll be asked to defecate on the table. Uh, also, the technicians before actually taking the patients into the magnet, uh, discuss with them what they mean when they say uh, de defecation, what they mean when they say Valsalva or Kegel, and that way the patient knows exactly what to do uh, when prompted uh, during the examination. Uh, and then also you will note in, in the table itself, uh, the Sine True Fist or Fiesta or BFFE FFE, FFE sequence during defecation in the sagittal plane uh, it has to be performed multiple times. So based on data from prior literature in the female pelvis, we know that every time uh, you repeat this, uh, there is, there is um, additional prolapse that, that you find. And so similarly, uh, in the male, we advocate doing this at least three times. Um, and finally, in certain patients that are not able to defecate, and, and oftentimes male patients are sent for constipation or, or incomplete defecation, uh, we advocate that the patients that are not able to defecate during the examination be taken off the exam, um, you know, maybe go to the bathroom and actually defecate, come back, and then do, repeat the sequence during straining to see 
if we elicit any prolapse at that time. So that, those are all important components of this protocol. Great. Well, thank you for that. So, Janesh, the article then proceeds to detail the differences between male and female pelvic floor anatomy, in particular the pubococcygeal line or PCL, the H line, the M line, and the anorectal angle. And you stress the importance of normal values for these measurements in males as are listed in Table 2. You mentioned that there are two angles that are unique to the male anatomy, and that these are the pubic angle and the prostatic urethral angle. Figures 12A and 12B show the measurements of the puberoprostatic angle at rest and during straining, while figure 12C shows an abnormal prostatic urethral angle in a patient with BPH. Can you discuss the significance of figure 12C to our viewers? And we'll put that up as you speak. Yeah, sure. So um, the prostatic urethral angle is a normally acute angle between the pro this proximal and distal prostatic urethra. Um, and you can see how that's measured in um, figure 12C. Um, in patients with BPH or enlarged prostates, this angle has been found to be increased, and this has been associated or correlated with bladder outlet obstruction and increased urinary retention, um, as was shown in a paper by Ku and colleagues that was um, um, published in Urology in 2010. Um, the thing to mention about their paper is that they did measure those angles using transrectal ultrasound and not MRI, um, but we still think that the data is, um, can be correlated. Terrific, thanks. So Janice, moving on, the next sections of the paper detail specific aspects of pelvic floor dysfunction in males, beginning with the gastrointestinal system. Your paper touches on a number of different GI issues, uh, but I want to focus on dyssynergia, which is the inability to coordinate the abdominal and pelvic floor musculature in order to initiate defecation. Can we look at figure 17 and uh, movie four as you talk through the evaluation of the anorectal angle during attempts at defecation? Sure, so the anorectal angle is an angle that's measured between the central axis of the anal canal and the posterior wall of the distal rectum. In males, there was a paper that was performed by Go and colleagues back in 2000 that evaluated um, normal values during dynamic MR in asymptomatic patients. And they found that a normal angle in males is usually about 101 degrees. Um, during attempted defecation now, which you can see in movie four, um, what usually happens is that you get relaxation of the puborectalis and the levator plate, which results in widening of the anorectal angle and results in opening of the anorectal junction, allowing for defecation to occur. In patients with dyssynergia, such as our 54-year-old patient in figure 17, you can actually see that instead of the angle getting wider, the angle, the angle actually becomes more acute because of paradoxical contraction of the puborectalis and levator plate, and this inhibits defecation. Great, thank you for that. Uh, so Gaurav, moving on to the evaluation of the urinary system. You discuss male urinary dysfunction symptoms categorized as lower urinary tract symptoms and functional and stress urinary incontinence. Uh, in this section of the paper, you describe the evaluation of urethral slings, uh, which are used to treat urinary incontinence. Can we look at figures 21 and 22 uh, and discuss the normal MR appearance and proper positioning of a urethral sling that is placed for urinary incontinence? Sure, yes. So urethral slings are thin strips of meth made of polypropylene material. And you know we've written about these in the female public floor, including in radiographics uh, in 2016. Uh, and they're less common in males. Um, and so as we look at in figure 21, the arrows point out uh, this linear hypointense structure going across the penile bulb or the corpus spongiosum uh, in, in part A. Uh, that's the, the mesh material that is a urethral sling going across the corpus spongiosum. And it's a little bit harder to see as it extends laterally into the perineum and, and along the, through, through the obturator foramen. But then on the sagittal image, what you want to see is you see the indentation along the inferior aspect of the corpus spongiosum. The key thing to, to look for here is that you want to have maintained corpus spongiosum tissue between the sling itself and the urethra, because in cases of erosion, that's what you may lose. That's some of the important things to note about, about this figure. Great, thank you. 
So Sandeep, the final section of the paper addresses male sexual dysfunction. Uh, the paper points out that while this is generally multifactorial in nature related to hormonal, uh, neurologic, and vascular etiologies, a non-relaxing pelvic floor muscle dysfunction can be contributory in some cases, particularly in those with chronic pelvic pain syndromes. Can you describe how ultrasound and MR can be used in men with chronic pelvic pain syndromes? Yes, so uh, there's really a lot of paucity of literature, uh, even with ultrasound. There are a few papers which the transperineal ultrasound can be used to evaluate the spasticity and edema in the muscles of the pelvic floor. So, and in MRI, I have started noticing that uh, some men have the thickening of the muscles. So, if you imagine like a spastic muscle, it might appear thickened. So, I don't have any data or anything to back up uh, right now, but I, I think thickness of the muscles is important, like spastic muscles will probably be thicker than uh, normal muscles. And uh, with MRI, you can look for, you can do a sequence to evaluate for any edema in the muscles. Um, or uh, you can also do uh, high resolution images of the uh, uh, pudendal nerve impingement. If there is, you know, pudendal nerve trapping going on and if there's edema in the muscles, uh, that can be helpful. But uh, re really, MR has not been evaluated for this week. Ultrasound has been evaluated, but also very, uh, in, uh, not a very, you know, uh, uh, not, not a very, in very large numbers, uh, I would want to say. And it's basically a new thing. Um, and uh, the things we look for is basically um, muscle thickening, muscle edema, uh, any uh, nerve entrapment uh, with high resolution ultrasound. And uh, also, people have used to, uh, ultrasound to inject botulinum toxins into the pelvic floor muscle directly to remove, uh, relieve pain. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Great, Sandeep. Thank you so much. So, Drs. Lekou, uh, Katri, and Aurora, I want to thank the three of you uh, for taking the time today to discuss your paper on the MR imaging of male, the male pelvic floor, which can be found in the current November 2019 issue of Radiographics. Doctors, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you.